For those new to this channel, my name is Kurt Jaimungle. I'm a filmmaker with a background in mathematical physics dedicated to the explication of what are called theories of everything from a theoretical physics perspective, clearly, but also exploring the potential connection consciousness has to the fundamental laws of nature, if those fundamental laws exist at all. The UFO phenomenon may seem tangential, but if you watch the podcast with Kevin Knuth, linked below, you'll see that there seems to be an intimate connection between some of the deep mysteries of the universe and this phenomenon. Thus, I'm interested, and I don't view this enigma with a stigma, I'm not averse to it like much of the scientific community is. Again, for those who are new to this channel, this is not a UFO channel per se. I'm interested in something called the theory of everything, which is, is an approach in physics that tries to unify all the fundamental forces and find the laws of the universe, what governs us. And I'm broadly interested in that, which means I'm interested in it from a theoretical physics perspective, as well as from a philosophical perspective, perhaps even a psychological perspective. Luis Elizondo is a former U.S. Army counterintelligence special agent who's gained notoriety now for being the director of the now-defunct ATIP program, which was a program initiated by the Defense Intelligence Agency in order to study unidentified aerial phenomenon, also known as UFOs. Lou has revealed more in this podcast than in almost any other interview, and that's due to the exquisite questions provided to me by you, as this was an Ask Me Anything, in fact it was a live AMA, so Lou and I both thank you for that. So first, I'm going to get to a question that I had, which is, is there a correlation between any of the characteristics of these UAPs, UFOs, and some other characteristic? For example, let's say that the tic-tac-shaped ones are more violent or the pyramidal-shaped ones are faster. Is there a classification of them? And do they have some other characteristic associated with them? So the, the, the characterizations that we have, we have seen to date really is a result uh, it, of, of size, believe it or not. So, and this is by, by no means comprehensive, but what we tend to see are the, the smaller vehicles tend to be, uh, think of a sports car or your, or your uh, saucer shaped vehicles. Whereas the larger vehicles, let's say a school bus size, uh, is that of a, of a cylindrical object or roughly that of a tic-tac or even sometimes described as a telephone pole. And then uh, in shape, so cylindrical. And then the, the, the tend to be the large ones, really large ones, tend to be uh, not always, but almost exclusively either triangular shape or boomerang shape. Now, there are some some some. Uh, anecdotal, uh, if you will, reports of, of large saucers as well and some shapes looking like a dumbbell. But the three primary categories tend to be uh, that we saw in ATIP were disc shape, and then you have uh, the longer cylindrical shape, and then finally a large, large triangular shape vehicle. Uh, the triangle vehicles are often described as flying uh, very uh, close to the ground and uh, very, very, uh, very quiet, silent and seem to kind of lumber, if you will, uh, from place to place, very slow, uh, almost like you would imagine a, a large dirigible, perhaps, um, just kind of floating there uh, silently. Um, the, the apex of those triangles are often described with lights of some sort or emitting some sort of, 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 of radiation in the, in the visible light spectrum, which uh, to a lot of the, the, the if you will, uh, people who reported this information to include first responders, um, we'll often see the lights changing color and uh, maybe maybe a result of some sort of Doppler shift that's occurring, red, blue Doppler shift. Um, but uh, that's, in essence, the, the, the three primary shapes that, that we, we have had reported. And are these shapes associated with any other characteristics? For example, violence or nonviolence or the shutting down of nuclear missiles? Yeah, Kurt, that's a great question. You know, so there's a difference between when we say something's a potential threat and, and hostile intent. And I think people have confused the term potential threat. When we say potential threat, you know, as a physicist, um, there's a lot of things in nature that are potential threats, but don't mean to harm you, right? It's just, it's, for example, I've often said, if I go to an airport and I get on a 737, there's no real threat there. But if I were to jump off and run along the runway, the tarmac, and I, I, I happen to get too close to one of these jet engines as it's you know going down the runway, chances are there's going to be some sort of biological consequence. There's, a, there's an environmental threat to me. I'm probably going to lose some hearing. Uh, I'm probably going to get burned by the jet exhaust. Um, it's not necessarily an intended consequence, 
of the jet engine to harm me. And so anytime you're dealing with, with physics, uh, and I think this topic of UAP certainly nests well within the, the, the realm of physics, there's always potential threat. Um, and that's just the way it, it works. If you ever go to the CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, uh, you're talking about uh, a, a, a massive machine, the, the world's largest machine, in fact, ever built. Um, and it's, it's hurtling some of the smallest particles around nearly the speed of light. And if you look at the shielding that is around the, 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 the accelerator, it's massive. Uh, you would think for something so, so tiny and infinitesimally small, uh, why do you need such a big machine? Well, it turns out that you know, there's there's potential consequences <laughs> when right. you're taking a, a particle of matter and you're accelerating it to the speed of light, almost the speed of light. Correct me, uh, correction. Um, so, uh, it's I think it's it's I think we need to be careful when we when we go down that rabbit hole and say something is is you know uh, threat versus hostile intent. You said, uh, is there any any signs that these things uh, are displaying some sort of you know overt hostility towards us or violence? I think you said. Um, you know, we in, in ATIP didn't see any overt signs of, as you say, violence. Um, but, you know, there are individuals who have reported that they've had um, contact. And whatever that contact is, it's not always been pleasant, according to some of the eyewitnesses. Now, the question is, have those eyewitnesses really had a close and personal interaction with this? Or is it some sort of psychological manifestation uh, that is occurring? uh we we simply don't know uh, for that reason we were very careful not to to stipulate any type of uh, intent behind these things and we focused the only two things we really focused on in ATIP was what is it and how does it work uh we we were nowhere near getting to the point where we understood its intentions or who was behind the wheel or the origins of these things it was simply just as you can appreciate a scientific approach what is it and how does it work and if we could answer those questions maybe we'd have a better chance of answering some of the other ones. You also mentioned that the June report may be a whole lot, a qu quotation, a whole lot of nothing. Now, why do you say that? And why do you think that is? And have you been briefed as to what's going to come out in the news report? Yeah, I mean, let me let me turn that question right back around, Kurt, and ask you a question. You know, if I were to write a, a 74 page uh, dissertation about a black hole, um, today, I probably it'd probably be a lot more comprehensive than if I were to write a 74-page dissertation about a black hole back in 1965, because at the time, these were theoretical objects that we weren't even sure if existed. Some scientists believe that they couldn't exist, that these were just some sort of anomaly within Einstein's calculations. So we, we don't have a really good, firm understanding of these things. And so, you know, what what are we going to provide to Congress? Well, we know that they're not U.S. technology. Okay, that's 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 a pretty big big step forward. But other than that, you know, we're still at the point where we don't know if these things are some sort of foreign adversarial technology, which it looks like they're probably not, or there's something else. Um, so, you know, there's not a whole lot you can say about that. You can say, look, there were you know 170 some incidents. Uh, of these incidents, uh, they performed in this way. These were the organizations involved. These were the people involved. This is the radar. This is the video. Here's the photographs. Here's the, the eyewitness testimony and reports. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we still don't know what we're dealing with. So I, I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to, in a 74-page document, conclusively state uh, and satisfy what, what something is and satisfies people, satisfy people's curiosity. Um, I think as time goes on and we, we, we continue to, to look at this, this enigma and perhaps create a whole of government approach, hopefully those reports each year become increasingly uh, more, more uh, forthcoming and we'll have additional details and fidelity. But I think it's just too early right now. Look, we just got to the point where Congress and the American government agree that these things are real. So uh, how much can you possibly expect an organization uh, in 180 days, and by the way, let's not forget that that the COVID restrictions, most of these people couldn't even go to work. Um, you know, I, I I try to be realistic. Well, to be fair, some of your interviews, what I gleaned from them in an hour is quite substantial. So I can imagine that if someone's given, a team of people are given 180 days, they can come up with what could shock people. That's you just said it. If you if you have a team of people, we, they didn't have that. The UAP task force was minimal, minimally manned. It had two people, and they were only part time assigned. So 
So that part of, of the argument isn't, you know, it hasn't been substantiated. And then the other part is 180 days. I would submit to you, it takes, as I've said before, longer to remodel a kitchen sometimes than, than 180 days. You, you, you're asking the entire intelligence community and the Department of Defense to collect the data, synthesize the data, process the data, and then, and then author the data, and then coordinate that data through all 18 agencies of the intelligence community, have it reviewed by the lawyers, have it signed, sealed, and delivered by the Secretary of Defense, then to the Director of National Intelligence, and then finally on to Congress. Uh, and oh, by the way, there's you know COVID we got to deal with. So anything classified, which most of this report is classified, you can't do it until you get to go to work. Right. So it's I, I think you know we're really expecting a lot. It's almost like like expecting Mike Tyson. To, to, to fight uh, in, in a boxing ring with, with, you know, both hands tied behind his back. Um, it's, it's, it's just not, I, I don't see how that's, that's reasonable. He would still defeat me. Okay. Oh, as, and me too. I'm sure. <laughs> as for the fidelity, you mentioned fidelity and a question that's been brought up by quite a few people. I don't have a single username to single out is, are there videos, pictures that you've seen that are not so grainy, not so far away, but instead up close exact, let's say, such that someone who is on the fence about this issue would no longer be on the fence. Yeah, and I think you're seeing that with Congress. I mean, there's 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 videos and, and photographs and reporting that I've been privy to that are extremely compelling. I've said for the record that the three videos that have come out, as, as interesting as they are, they're probably the least compelling of the ones that that you know we we, we had. And and this is why I'm so concerned about now the recent revelations that the Pentagon has deleted or destroyed my emails and my, my, my files because there were documents on, in a, a very comprehensive shared folder that we had that was, was, that was you know, pretty incredible. I mean, there was some, some, some very high, high definition, high fidelity videos in there that when you looked at it, you realize, hey, you know, that's, that's not one of our aircraft. Many in the audience had one more question with regard to this issue, which is why now? Why all these revelations from the government all of a sudden? Because we weren't able to get to it over the live stream, I emailed him and his assistant got back saying, as for your question, why now? Why not now? Nothing will ever change. Nothing will change if a few brave men and women don't stand up to speak out about what they know. Lou has talked about this many times in many interviews. He was trying to raise the alarm about this issue, but it wasn't getting reported up the chain of command to the Secretary of Defense. In the U.S. defense community, if someone is frustrated with bureaucracy, there is no way to circumvent the chain of command. So it's typical for those people to resign, and then it's often the resignation letter, which finally makes its way up the chain to effect change. That's exactly what happened in Lou's case. Feel free to reference previous interviews that he's given where he's answered this question. Have there been any investigations as to the connection between remote viewing and UAPs? So you can interpret that the way you'd like. Wow, great question, Kurt. Um... Historically, yeah, that there was there was some effort, uh, particularly in the in the seventies and the eighties, uh, during a program that one of my colleagues was responsible for, uh, the Stargate program, and before that it was Real Flame, and before that a bunch of other names. But uh, Dr. Uh, Harold Pudoff can can probably give you some more information on that. During our time in ATIP, we didn't really focus on that; we were more focused on the nuts and bolts. But yeah, there was you know there was some some interesting information. That was put out uh, in the past about about that about the the, the connection between remote viewing and, and potential UAP activity. There was one uh, I think um, alleged uh, remote viewing session where they were remote viewing a particular enemy target, seaborne, uh, a sea based target. I'm not going to go into more detail than that. I don't know if I can, um, but apparently there was some sort of UAP activity associated with that. Uh, the problem is when you're talking about remote viewing, it's 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 very subjective. And so you have to be very careful uh, when, when you're dealing with data like that, because um, it's at the end of the day, you need more information. Uh, you need information to substantiate. That's, that may be one piece of the puzzle, but by no means can you put together the entire mosaic with just one piece of the puzzle. You need, you need all the pieces to really, really you know, understand what you're looking at. You mentioned someone's name about a minute ago, Harold. What was his last name? Putoff. Okay, yeah, I have a question about that from Jeremy Riss of the channel Alien Scientist. He wants to know, have you ever heard of something called the Invisible College? And then as a secondary question, was this theoretical physicist who brought you into the program, you mentioned this before that someone brought you in to ATIP, was it Hal Putoff? I'm very well aware of the, the term Invisible College. 
Uh, I am also very well aware of Hal. Hal is a, is a dear friend of mine. He did not bring me into this program, uh, but we wound up uh, working as, as colleagues. Um, he's an incredible human being. Uh, him, another individual named Dr. Kit Green, uh, another fantastic human being, an absolute American treasure. Um, and there's a couple others. Dr. Eric Davis is another one. Um, I, I really was very fortunate. I had the opportunity to, to truly stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, it was an incredible honor. For me. And there's many others that I, I won't mention right now, but Dr. Colin Kelleher and a bunch of others that were you know, really, really helpful uh, in the early days of, of, of this effort. What is it that you've heard about the Invisible College that you can reveal that you feel like is credible? I just heard the term yesterday. I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's a loose affiliation of individuals. Um, you know, that's the term invisible. Uh, college being that these are individuals who obviously have a high uh, academic vitae uh, to their name. Um, you know, it's, it's more of a, a loose affiliation necessarily than a... Um, uh, you know, a, a formalized uh, <laughs> corporation. Um, you know, it's the, you might also hear terms like the aviary, which, uh, you know, there's, there's some truth to that. There were some individuals that belonged to an organization. And uh, to, to, to remain anonymous, uh, they had uh, names of birds associated with them. So names of birds. To, birds, right. That's the term aviary. And what it did is it gave them an extra degree of anonymity uh, when, when having discussions, uh, you know, especially over open lines or the email, unsecured email, um, you know, that, that, that's, it's just a layer, extra layer of operation, what we call OPSEC. Speaking of academia, this question comes from professor of astronomy, Brian Keating, who runs the into the impossible podcast. Is there any test or data that would convince you that every UAP sighting has a prosaic natural or a scientific explanation, i.e. anything that could falsify the narrative that alien technology is visiting the earth. Now I know we can put a clause to that and say whether or not they're visiting or whether or not they're from a dimension that is, uh, you and me may not like the term dimension in the way that it's used in common parlance, but we can couch whether or not it's visiting. You understand what's meant so, by the term alien. Yeah, I do. So Kurt, I'm going to ask you a favor to repeat that question one more time because there's, there's a bit of a contradiction in there. And I want to, sure, sure, sure. great, great, great. This comes from yeah. professor of astronomy, Brian Keating, who runs the into the impossible podcast, which I recommend you all check out and subscribe to. Is there any test or data that would convince you that every UAP sighting has a prosaic natural or scientific explanation? i.e. anything that could falsify the narrative that alien technology is visiting the Earth. So, interesting. Natural or scientific prosaic explanation, and then turns around and says, i.e. disproves some sort of alien visitation. Um, I'm not sure the two are mutually exclusive. I, I think, you know, I, I think you can have a discussion about alien life and still remain scientific. We're doing it now with NASA looking for microbial life on Mars. They're not exclusive. You can't say in one hand, you know, there's a scientific explanation, but it's not, but it disproves alien life. Scientific explanation may wind up actually proving alien life if there is. So, so I, I, I think that's, I think that with all, with all due respect, I, I think that's false logic. Um, I don't, I don't, no offense to Mr. Keating at all. I'm sure, uh, you know, he, he, he wants a, a thorough answer, which I'm going to try to do my best. But the very notion that an alien life form can't be scientific. Look, this planet is probably the greatest UFO that we know of, right? This ball called Earth hurtling through deep space around a, you know, obscure star we call the sun in an obscure part of the Milky Way has got life all over the place. In fact, the birth of science was right here. Uh, and it was it was the study of, of of other living organisms. Look at Darwin, right? So so I, I I think we need to be careful when we subscribe to the fact that if it's alien, it can't be scientific, or if it's scientific, it can't be alien. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think um, we 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 realize now with with the understanding of extremophiles that life can defy a lot of our 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 definitions and continues to defy our definitions. We have to keep reinventing new definitions of what a life form is. You know, initially we thought all life forms were, were something that were, were based on, on ultimately on, on the building blocks of photosynthesis. We now realize that's not true. There are extremophiles that live and, and survive of chemosynthesis in the deepest parts of our ocean, a completely different 
way of obtaining nutrients from its environment. We also realize that the, the, the understanding that life form must have DNA, we now realize may not be true also. In the world of virology, we see all the time viruses which can replicate and behave very much like a living thing and yet have no DNA associated. They have RNA. So uh, I think we have to be careful when we ask questions, especially as scientists. We have to make sure that we, to really embody the essence of science, we have to be willing to ask the hard questions because that's the only way science really advances. Otherwise, we, we would be stuck thinking that the four elements of the earth are earth, wind, fire, and water. You know, it, we, we've now realized this thing called the periodic table. We now realize this thing called so, you know, uh, uh, subatomic particles and quantum physics. Had we have just stuck to that as being science and not challenging the ecosystem of science at the time, we never would be here. We never would have had Newtonian physics. We never would have had Einstein's relativity. We wouldn't have quantum physics. So again, I caution one more time against uh, the, the idea that, that the science is that science and a, 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 a scientific explanation will automatically rule out something alien. Now, I think what he was trying to say, uh, your, your friend, Mr. Keating, and I, and I, I Forgive me through going this long-winded explanation. Sure, go ahead. And I appreciate how you're taking notes. I appreciate the seriousness to which you're yeah, answering yeah, yeah, these no questions. Worries. I think what he's probably saying, asking me is, hey, Lou, is, is there any examples that you can say that, A, you have found a prosaic explanation for something that initially seemed unidentified or perhaps you know extraordinary? The answer is absolutely yes, we have. In fact, that was the intent of ATIP, to go into something, trying to find, is this a drone? Is this some sort of cruise missile? Is this some sort of new type of aircraft or helicopter or blimp or dirigible, or, you know, you know, atmospheric anomaly, you name it, fill in the blank. Is um, there a checklist, yes, there by the way, that one goes through? Like, is it a lens flare? Is it a drone? So yeah, there's absolutely. And you have, when you have the experts that are, you know, experts in, in those particular fields, such as photography or video or whatever, they're going through that mental checklist. Is an artifact, right? Uh, so if it's, is it a software glitch? Is it a lens flare? Is it a, a scratch on the lens that now is being uh, hyper magnified? And so you get, the, you know, a, a, this weird uh, uh, scattering of light effect. And it looks like you have a real object there when you don't, right? Uh, and so that's when you compare it to the infrared. And that's when you compare it also to the radar, when you compare it to the eyewitnesses, right? Because, you know, there's a, when you have that, that amount of information now all verifying that something is real, then... You, you, know, you can start scratching up the fact that it's some sort of artifact or, you know, lens flare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that there were times where we were able to do that. And it's a, it's a bit satisfying because you can kind of take that off the list. What, what for us was so difficult were the ones that fell so far beyond what we would normally presume as capable capabilities that we have in our inventory. Again, the instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocities, uh, transmedium travel, and, and, you know, seemingly anti-gravity without associated technologies, no wings, control surfaces, no obvious signs of propulsion, uh, no heat signature, and yet the things were able to defy, you know, our, our, the, the natural effects of Earth's gravity. Those are the ones where you say, okay, now we're not probably dealing with, you know, a helicopter. We're not dealing, there's no rotor wash, there's no heat signature, there's nothing at all that, that, that we can look at with the multiple sensors that we're looking at something and say, yeah, that, that fits within the paradigm of, you know, our existing aviation technology. Um, so there you have it. I didn't mean to again, go into a long winded conversation. I prefer long winded, man. I'm a meticulous person. I also noted that you said <laughs> mental checklists is what they go through. And I was curious if due diligence is a physical checklist or a standardized one, a formalized one. Yes, but but those depending on where that expertise resides. So if you're asking, for example, a CIA analyst who is an expert in, in optics, they're going to go through their own checklist differently than a radar person who's an expert in radar uh, and telemetry who's going to go through their checklist. So, you know, there's not one single checklist because depending on the expertise that's being used and leverage, just like consider look, talking to a cardiologist versus a radiologist, right? Right, right, they're right. right. Both medical yeah. doctors, but they're not going to go through the same checklist, you know, when, when looking at someone's heart, you know, one's looking at it from, from a x-ray perspective, one's looking at it, you know, maybe from a, from a more, from a biological and met metabolic process perspective. So, uh, those checklists exist, but they're not consistent across the board. You mentioned transmedium as well. 
I'm curious if you've seen any footage where a UAP goes from air to water, and is there a splash involved? Or do they just submerge as if it's an illusion, let's say, or an artifact of light? Not saying that they are artifacts of light. I'm just curious if they right. displace the water in any formidable fashion. Yeah, well, Kurt, there seems to be some sort of interaction. I will, I will state that there's been, been plenty of reports that we have where the water seems to be perturbed, that there is a disturbance over the water. Uh, and there's several hypotheses that have been proposed for that. Um, no different than when you have a helicopter hovering over the water, you can see the water being a bit perturbed from the rotor wash. Uh, yet these don't have rotor wash, but, but the water seems to be, be perturbed, roiling, if you will. And we've seen that over and over again, not just with the Nimitz incident. There's some incidents near, near off the coast of Puerto Rico. There's been some other incidents as well where, where the, the reporting by government officials has been that there is some sort of disturbance in the water. Um, the question is, what is causing those disturbances? If you look at biology, for example, look at an alligator, we just now realized over the last maybe decade or two that there are ULFs, ultra low frequencies, acoustic signatures that are emitted by alligators when they are in mating season in the rivers and the lakes. And you can actually see as they put their head up, uh, you can't hear it, uh, but the water begins to what looks like a dance around, around them. And what's happening is these ultra low frequencies, acoustic frequencies are, are perturbing the water, disturbing the water and, and the, the metrics of the, that the matrix of the water is, is, the, is, is part of. It. And so it begins to, to, to royal. Um, you know, is this something similar? It could be. We don't, we don't know yet because we don't understand the technology fully, you know, but we, we suspect that this, this disturbance in the water could be a, a well, you know, could, could be a result of, of the technology being, being utilized. Uh, you know, no different than a helicopter, perhaps, with its rotor wash perturbing the water. But rather than being a physical or mechanical perturbance, it might be due to some sort of electromagnetic interference that's occurring. Right. Lou, I wanted to thank you for how open you are, how frank you are. I'm not, actually, I'm not used to that when, I'm, when I speak to people about this topic. So firstly, thank you about that. Well, I look, Kurt, I don't have all the answers. And, and I'm going to tell you that, you know, you're asking me direct questions. I'll give you direct answers. I'll do you the, I'll do the best that I can. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't have all the answers and I'm not, I'm not afraid to say that. I'm not afraid. to. And some are classified as well. Yeah. And, and some details are definitely are, are you know, sensitive. You can't get out. Right. And for the people watching in the chat, if I don't get to your question, please, it's because I'm in the moment with Lou. I don't want to keep switching tabs. I want to listen to Lou's answer and ask pertinent follow-up questions. Okay, Manny. And by the or... way, for the record, if I can just real quick, sure. let me go back. That, your friend, Mr. Keating, I, I didn't mean any disrespect by that. Please make sure he knows that I just wanted to answer his question to the best of my ability. I wasn't trying to, to, to this wasn't a slam in any way. I just, uh, I just wanted to be as accurate as possible. For sure, for sure. Manny Ortez asks, Lou once said on a podcast that someone from the Pentagon told him that they knew that these that this phenomenon are demons. Although Lou didn't seem to believe it, I would love for Lou to expand on that. Well, Kurt, let me ask you this. Um, you know, what? what is a demon, right? I think most people would, would, would submit to you that a demon is some sort of supernatural being that is based in some sort of religious doctrine uh, and is usually, you know, malevolent to some degree. Um, but, you know, let's, let's look at this from a scientific perspective. All things, by definition, are supernatural until they're, they're explained, until they're normal, right? This cellular telephone I'm speaking to you on and this the Wi-Fi signals 100 years ago would be completely supernatural. And yet in some parts of the world, actually, if I show a picture, you know, of somebody, then that's still supernatural. They think the soul is, is locked in the photograph. Everything is, is, is paranormal until it becomes normal. Everything is supernatural until it becomes natural. And that is, that is the definition of it. It just means beyond our understanding of, of, of you know, what, what's before us. Um, I can't, you know, I can't tell anybody with a straight face that something is or is not demonic because it really depends on what is your definition of a demon. And at the end of the day, you know, I've seen enough demons in my life in combat and warfare to know that, you know, there really is true evil in this world. A lot of it is man-made, but, um, you know, I, uh, I, can't, I can't discount that. I, I, I don't personally believe that myself, but, 
you know, I'm a big firm believer of know thy enemy. If it turns out that these things are demonic, at least we know, you know, I'd rather know than, than to guess, um, you know, do I subscribe to that line of thinking that these are demons? No, not particularly. What about angels? Great question. Same, it's exactly the same thing. Angels and demons, you know, supernatural beings that, that that we can't explain that that seem to 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 fall outside the, the realm of, of of what we consider being normal human behavior and normal human capabilities um okay let know, me steel I, man the question let me steel man it when i say steel man hopefully you're familiar with the term what i'm i think what the person is getting at is that let's imagine let's presuppose in a certain worldview that there's a deity that created the universe with intent and one of the first creatures they created were powerful beings that have divine powers. Some of those are angels, some of those are demons, and then humans were created, or let's say the Big Bang was set off, and then humans were created via the process of evolution. So do you see or do you see evidence, or do you have friends with an ATIP who believe that those are demons in that sense, or angels in that sense even? Um, I didn't see that in ATIP. Um but I did see it in DOD leadership. Um, you know, I, 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 I certainly am not going to confront someone's spiritual beliefs about something. You know, the word angel comes from the word anhelios of, of light, of fire. Think of helios, the sun, right? Our sun. Um, these are terms that, that, that have been given to, to, to explain supernatural beings and occurrences in, 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 you know, during our existence. Um, you know, I, I am for one, I, I, despite being a, a scientific man, I am, I am a very much a spiritual. Um, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve, but I don't think that the topic of UAPs uh, or even potentially extraterrestrials is necessarily against the idea of organized religion. When I went to Rome not too long ago, a couple years, and a half ago, maybe, uh, and spoke to some very senior academics in the Vatican. They they told me that that in the 1600s, had you have told people there was no such thing as aliens, that would be considered heresy, because there is no there is no limit to the dominion of God or the notion of God. And it's only been in, in relative recent history that we have put these limitations on what God can and can't do. You know, uh, there, there can't be aliens because we have to be the most you know the divine most divine representation of God. Um, you know, so I, I, I find that topic fascinating, especially as it relates to theology and philosophy, and even sociology, our, our reaction to it as a, as a species. Um, but I, I, I did not come into contact with that. Uh, and, if, and if it was an ATIP, it was kept hidden from, from us. No, no, one, no one talked about that. No one seemed to have any type of religious aversion um, looking into this topic. All right. The next question comes from Bisec Docs. Have we intercepted communication between UAPs and or has there been communication with UAPs? I'm not aware of any uh, interception of communications with UAPs. Um, as far as communication with UAPs, you know, once again, I'm, I kind of hate to split hairs here. I don't want to upset anybody, but let's let's be specific. What does communicate mean? I mean, you and I are having a conversation in English and we're communicating, but if I stand behind uh, a wall and I, 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 I aim an assault rifle at you, am I communicating with you? Yeah, I am. I'm communicating an intent or a threat, right? If a dog uh, growls and shows its teeth to you uh, as you try to kneel down and pet it, is it communicating? Yeah, it's communicating. It's telling you, hey, you know, I, I don't want to be pet right now. I don't, 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 don't touch me. So, you know, um, if, if a UAP is, is uh, behaving in a provocative manner, meaning it it's, it's, uh, um, obviously knows that we are, are aware that it is there and doesn't seem to mind, doesn't seem to try to hide itself in some cases, it's been perhaps uh, hovering uh, over, over you know, one of our military equities for, for a prolonged period of time, is that communication? Well, I would submit to you, yes, it's probably communication. It's not verbal communication. But, but it's signaling some sort of intent. Yes, I know you're there. And yes, I know you know that I'm here. And I'm okay with that. And I, I want you to know that I'm here. Now, what's the rationale? What's the reasoning intent behind it? We don't know. But that is communication. 
if, if you know, when, when we, when we do a show of force, um, and if, you know, we fly an SR 71 at a hundred thousand feet and we don't want the enemy to see us. But if I take a couple F 22 Raptors and I fly off the coast of, let's say, uh, a disputed territory in the South China sea, I'm communicating with, with a country. I'm, <laughs> it may not be through dialogue, but make no mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm communicating very clearly and very effectively my intent, um, to, to another, to another party. And so, um, I think therein lies the question. Uh, are these things trying to communicate with us? And if so, uh, do, will we be smart enough to recognize it as, as, as some sort of communication uh, versus just you know, uh, two ships passing in the night? I, I do think that the, the more brazen that these, these incidents become, the more there may be an attempt to try to communicate. They're, they're, they're obviously, whatever it is, is aware that we are there and we are aware that they're there. Are you aware of any more or of any less coarse grained communication? For example, we can communicate with the cheetah, like you mentioned, we can point a gun at it or we can show our hostility or our civility. Is there verbal, as far as you know, has there been any verbal or even telepathic direct communication? I'm sorry, my uh, audio just cut off. Has there call. been any verbal or telepathic communication? I know that there's a story about. I think Zimbabwe, Africa, with aliens communicating with some children. There's certainly reports of it. Doesn't mean that it's it, it's it's see the problem is subjective. We 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 don't know for sure. It's it's the human's interpretation of what's going on, and and here is why we have to be so careful. As you know, in a scientific experiment and in a closed system, you know the 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 the, the likelihood of human error is increased significantly, and so uh, you know we have to be be cognizant of that. Um, is there some sort of real communication, as you say, telepathic communication occurring, or is it uh, uh, a, a similar effect to, let's say, taking a hallucinogenic uh, uh, drug and having some sort of experience, right, mental uh, experience? I don't know the answer to that. The answer could be yes or both or none. It could be that there, there, there is. It's just our, it's uh, our impression of what's going on. Uh, and it's not real, right? Like the, a near death experience. A lot of people report it being real. A lot of people say, no, it's just parts of the mind that are beginning to shut down and you start, you know, having these experiences. I don't think anybody really knows for sure, other than the people who've actually experienced it. When you talk to them, they feel very compelled that they've had a real event. And I'm not, I, I don't doubt for one minute, they actually believe they've had some sort of communication. And by the way, that could be the case. Because, right. Again, there's no way to prove it or disprove it. So it's, it, it's interesting. Um, but we didn't focus at all about that part of ATIP because it's, 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 it's too subjective. You can't quantify and qualify that data like you can with radar data and photographic evidence, et cetera. So uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't particularly useful. Not that I'm saying it's not interesting. It just wasn't useful for, for our calculus. As to the connection between psychedelics and aliens or psychedelics and UAPs, you're unaware of any credible, verifiable, falsifiable data? Well, look, I mean... Now we're getting into the world of consciousness, you know, and, and I would submit to you, is not everything we do a, a result of, 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 a, of a conscious process occurring in our brain? Um, you know, by very definition, everything I do in life is a result of, of some sort of willful intent based upon a, a consciousness process occurring in my brain, just like you and everybody else. So, um, you know, we realize that that human consciousness is, is, is an area that we're just now beginning to explore and, and we understand even less. Is it possible that human consciousness is part of a universal consciousness and that we can tap into this? Is, it's, not, it's not human consciousness is not only for humans, possibly. I mean, I, there's people out there who have pet cats and dogs. I'm one of them where, you know, you have a connection with your pet, not because it's just a cat or a dog, but because you, there's something deeper that you are, you are connecting with, something far more intimate, something far more sacred than just a, you know, a furry little bag of skin and, and you know, hairballs. There's, there's, there's something, and by the way, that life form recognizes you as well as a sentient being. There's this appreciation that, hey, we're on the same wavelength. I may not look like you, I may not act like you or talk like you, but we're kind of the same thing. We're both conscious sentient beings and we recognize that in each other um you know and it's that they also may explain uh, human interactions as well so you, consciousness may not be um something that is that is only uh you know 
owned and defined by the human species. Um, is it possible there's other things if we can communicate with dolphins and cats and dogs and birds and, you know, gorillas? Maybe human consciousness isn't quite, so, maybe it's not so special. Maybe it's indelible. Maybe it's something that's part of, part of all of nature. And when I say all of nature, even beyond this planet, perhaps. The next question comes from Mick West. I'd like to ask Lou Elizondo, does, I'll just read this verbatim, if he really thinks this is non-human technology that can revolutionize the world and maybe include contact with aliens and extra-dimensional beings and so on, why is he so concerned with NDAs? Surely for the good of humanity, he should release the evidence that he has. Ah, surely for the good of humanity. And then he can go ahead and pay for my mortgage. He can put my kids through school. He can come visit me every day and give me soup while I'm behind bars spending the next 40 years of my life, uh, you know, doing a service for, for, for somebody else. I've already put my neck on the line. Uh, so I'll do respect, Mr. West. Um, you know, uh, if, if, why don't you, there's nothing stopping you. Why don't you do it? You know, I've, I've already put my career, my, my reputation and credibility on the line. I've already foregone my, my retirement uh, and my pension. How much more else do you expect me to sacrifice? You want me to put myself up on a cross and nail myself to it? Just, just because, you know, I, I think we've come pretty far so far. I think, I think I haven't had to go to jail and we've come pretty damn far in the last three years, you know? So uh, I guess a simple, you're welcome uh, is, is probably, you know, would be my response. Are there whistleblower protection acts that you could reveal information under? Well, this is part of the IG process. This is part of, of, of Congress. You know, there are people that I can speak with without violating my non-disclosure agreement that can further the, the conversation, you know, and this is what we're trying to exercise. I mean, I, I've tried to be as clear as I can with our, our roadmap moving forward without jeopardizing it. But if people notice one thing about me is that we're, you know, I'm deliberate. I don't do anything haphazard. So all the stuff that people are now seeing with conversations and Congress and IG, do people honestly think that's just some sort of coincidence? I mean. Guys, if you look at what I've been saying the last three years, you're going to see a pattern. It's very clear. It, you're going to see everything I've said has come to fruition. Lock, stock, and barrel. You know, this is we're trying to do this the right way. And, and as I said before, there's a difference between doing things right and right now. And I prefer to do things right. You know, this is a process. I've told people from day one. You know, if you're expecting instant gratification, then you know, go go take up something else. Go take up finger painting. Don't don't do this because. This this is going to be a, a long term effort, and 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 it's it's every day the due diligence of what we're doing, but it's making a difference. Just look at the last three years, how far we've come. We have an official UAP task force. We have the government admitting that UFOs are real. We have Congress being briefed at the classified level. They're all coming out saying this is important. We actually have the task force now providing information to Congress in a 180 day report. We have other countries like Japan coming out and reaching out and wanting to to share their information with us. I mean. Man, how much more do you want in three years? You know. It, so again, uh, forgive me for being a little bit, you know, testy about this. That's I think fine. A lot do of questions like, like that this, annoy you? Do you get them frequently, and you're tired of them? Well, you know what? It's it's armchair quarterbacking. It's it's easy for people to sit back. I see it all the time on social media. Just violate your NDA, Lou. It's okay. You you go to jail for us. It's okay. But they're not willing to do you know one tenth of that sacrifice for this effort. If you ask them, hey, get off your ass and go go talk to your congressman or you know, start start doing research and start going out and 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 being a a, a force multiplier for this effort. They want I'm, I'm too tired. Uh, I got too much go. I'm too busy. Well, I got my family to take care of. Well, so do I. I'm not different. Why why am I being held to a different standard? Why am I have to be you know the person coming out there and just say hell to everybody and wind up having to go run and, and hide in some foreign country and never come back to my country? I love my country. By the way, my non-disclosure agreement I took was a promise I made to the American people, not my government. And so I think it's really disingenuous to say, well, you can just break your promise this time to, to, for, the, for the truth. No, I can't. That's like saying, well, you can cheat on your wife this, only this time, or, or you, know, you, can, you can cheat on your family this time. It won't matter. Yes, it does matter. Every time matters. It's a promise. That's what a promise is. Either, either you're a man of your word or a woman of your word, or you're not. Otherwise, and they're called principles and, and people fight and die for those principles. And, you know, I've seen people fight and die for those principles. You know, they're not just something that you conveniently throw around. Oh, I promise to do this. And then really later on say, no, I don't really promise. You know, 
That's that's not the way promises work. Those are the kind of people that don't survive in combat because people will have your back. You know, you 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 swear an oath of an allegiance to do the right thing. That's that's what this is about. You know, I, I don't understand people who can just say, hey, go ahead and, and, and break your promise this one time. I mean, what are you talking about? What the, you'd never trust me again. I can't break this one time because the one time I do, then I could do it a thousand times. And at that point, I might as well throw in the towel. Mm-hmm. So I anyways, Lou, let me let me push back. I'm like I'm on your camp. I'm on your side, man. So let me just be friendly and push back. With regard to breaking a promise, to me, this seems like the difference between, as Jesus said, the spirit of the law versus the text of the law. So do you see an obligation to the spirit of the law rather than the text? So the text says you have to obey this promise. Well, he also said follow the law of the land, too, didn't he? And so, you know, the law of the land here is that he took an oath and, and a promise to the American people. And I'm not going to violate that promise. It, it, you can't break a promise to fulfill a promise. It okay, doesn't work push, that way. Please, let me push back. I'm, uh, yeah, gently. Yeah. Okay. This is something I've been thinking about. Sometimes trust needs to be broken in order for it to be regained in the long term stronger. So, for example, you mentioned cheating on a spouse. Sometimes one has to come clean and say, I did cheat in order for the relationship to eventually be repaired, even though that in the short run is going to be far worse. Wouldn't it be better not to cheat at all and not have to do that? Yeah, you're right. You need to, if you cheat, you need to, you need to admit you cheated, but, but isn't it better just not to cheat and you don't have to worry about that? I agree. Okay. So in this analogy, in this analogy, the cheating would be, let's say, let's say you had some piece of information that says that our world is vastly different and potentially even dangerous or wasteful on behalf of the government. Do you see a sense of duty to the citizens to break your oath? I know you say that it's the oath with the yeah. citizens themselves, but you understand where I'm going with this. But you don't have to. There are mechanisms in place that that you don't have to break that oath to fulfill a promise. That's what I'm trying to say here. It's not an either or. It just takes more and time. By the way, it's a lot more. Yeah, it takes more time. But but it's the right way to do it. That that's that is the correct way to do it. Than just going ahead and and you know, I, I I I can't I won't be able to live with myself doing that. No one will ever take me seriously again. Nobody could ever trust me if I break that promise just that one time. That's not the way it works. So, you know, I, I think the proof is in the pudding. And, I, you know, honestly, I'm, look, bottom line is I'm not going to break it. So people can keep asking me all day long and they're, they're wasting their oxygen because I am not going to break that promise. I will not violate my non-disclosure agreement. Got it. Got and it. by the way, I'll tell you, if it comes to the point where I have to actually stop doing this to maintain my promise, I will. I will disappear. You'll never hear from Lou again. If the option in between comes down to me having to speak or having to and, and break my promise or being quiet, I will be quiet. I will not break my promise. And if people can't accept that, then, you know, fine. talk to somebody else. I don't know what to tell you. Well, I'm grateful that you're not quiet right now. And thank you for speaking with me. Lonesome Space Cowboy asks, I just have one question, pretty subjective, but I'd like to hear his take. If the general public knew and saw what Lewis knows and has seen, what would the world look like for the next week after that? How would the public react? So this is, you can surmise. Wow. What a thoughtful question. Um, boy, I have no idea, Kurt. That, that, that's, um, I would need to think about that. Okay, we can Not get back to that question. question. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's such a good question. I don't, I don't want to just throw out an answer. And right. I, I, I want to think about that. And I might need I, I might need even a little bit more time. I, I will for sure get back to you on that. But um, that's going to take some thought. Great, great. I'm going to take a question from the audience. So Genshin says Tom DeLong says that the occupants of the UAPs are called the others in quotation. Do you know anything about this? I mean, that's what he wants to name them. You know, I, I, I got I, my, my German shepherd is named Hercules. You know, but you can call them whatever you want. I mean, I, I, it's a name, right? I, I don't, you can, you can, is he calling them the others? Do the others call themselves others? Or, you know, it, 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 I, I would probably ask Tom that question. I, 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 I can't answer that question. Here's something I, I heard when I was looking up some interviews with Bob Lazar that the aliens refer to us as containers, or at least he read that he can't substantiate it. Have you heard this and what do you make of it? 
not a clue. And, and I and who was that you said? Bob, was that Bob Lazar you said? Yeah. I, I, I can't speak for Mr. Lazar. I've never met the man. I don't know. He was not part of the H effort. Uh, and therefore, I can't I can't expound upon that. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. I have no idea. Between you and I, this is like a foray for me because my background is in physics and math. And I had no idea that people were so divisive when it comes to Bob Lazar and just individuals in this UFO community in general, that if you say you believe them, then you're ostracized. Or if you say that you don't believe them, you're also ostracized by a certain sub subset. Do you, do you have views on Bob Lazar, whether you find him credible? I I, I never, I've never met him. I, I don't know his background. I don't know his story. I, I do know George Knapp. He's very credible. Uh, I, I, I don't know anything more than, than I guess George Knapp had may, may have helped break the story at one point. Uh, but I, I don't know Mr. Lazar, and out of due respect for Mr. Lazar and his family and those his, his friends and colleagues and those in the community, um, I, I don't have a comment. You know, it's it's that's part of the problem. People people offer a lot of what they think instead of what they know, and so when you mention someone like that, uh, people automatically, you know, well, I think this, I think that. Well, okay, I respect that, but but the question is, what do we know? And right now, I don't know a whole lot about Mr. Lazar, so it's it's not fair for me to really provide any any type of opinion one way or the other. Pulsating Shadow asks, how frequently do abductions happen among civilian slash military personnel? And is there substance to the rumor of human mutilation? I also want to ask you about cattle mutilation at some point, but that's that. Uh, um, well, uh, you know, abductions is something we, we didn't really look at. Uh, in eight, uh, because it's again too subjective. We're relying on the human being to give us data uh, with without anything else really substantiating that. Other like unlike radar data and, and, and gun camera footage, um, I'm aware of a lot of those reports, but but I don't have a comment either way. I, I simply don't know. Um, and, and as interesting as it may be, it's not it wasn't overly helpful to the perspective of, of, of our efforts in ATIP, to, to the specific calculus we were working on. Remember, what is it and how does it work? Um, that really didn't come into play in that calculus. Now, as far as human mutilation, um, that's another topic that I'm completely unqualified to, to, to discuss because uh, I simply don't know. Um, certainly, if that is the case, then, then we are dealing with a potential threat, possibly hostile intent, because from where I come from as a former investigator and special agent, that's a crime. First of all, it's called kidnapping. Second of all, second of all, it's called assault. Um, you know, and, and third of all, it may even be <laughs> in, in an extreme case. It could be considered, you know, first degree premeditated murder. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I, I I don't know anything about that really. Um, you know, I am aware of, of, the, of the cattle mutilations a little bit more because I've spoken to some veterinarians and some, some doctors. Um, you know, there's a lot of prosaic explanations. I think it's fascinating. I think it's interesting. Uh, but I'm not a certified medical doctor nor a coroner, so I can't I can't look at a cadaver of a of a, of a bovine of a, of a of a cow and say uh, the lips were removed with a surgical precision without any type of uh, heat ablation or cauterization, uh, and yet you know it was it was a perfect clean cut. There's no bleeding. I, I, I don't know what can cause that. I don't know if there's a natural process that can explain that. I, I haven't seen one, but maybe there is. Could it be predatory behavior of coyotes uh, eating that part of the meat that is uh, uh, most rich in nutrients or accessible? Uh, I, I don't. I don't know the answer. Um, or is it something else? You know, there's there's a lot of people who say there's there's perhaps something else to it. Um, again, I, I I don't really know. This one comes from Lady Shar reacts. Mr. Elizondo, do you think there was another craft under the water that was causing the UAP disturbance that Commander Fravor reported? Great question. It's exactly what we're trying to figure out. There's some other stories that are going to come to light, some other incidents that are going to be, I think, fairly riveting when people find out, uh, you know, that <laughs> what, what's occurred uh, in and around some of our military operations. Um, it's, it's possible there could be something underneath the water. It could also be a, uh, like I said, a reaction to the, to the technology being employed um, by what's ever on top of the water. We, we, we don't know yet. Um, I think we're getting a little bit closer to answering that. Of course, if we can get some, some sonar data um, to, to validate, maybe there's some, something in the water at the same time as we see something in the air, that would be very helpful in substantiating that. 
Amjad Hussein, who actually sponsors the podcast with his company Algo, asks, are any alien bodies in possession of the U.S. government? So, Mr. Hussein, again, great question. Uh, it's a question that a lot of people want to know, and it's a question that I can't answer because I, I have been privy to that. Uh, I do not know if there's any type of biological organisms that uh, that are in the possession of the U.S. government. I, I, I do believe, as I've said before, for the record, that we are in possession of material. I won't go, I won't elaborate into more than that. Um, but as far as having biological specimens, it's something that I, I, I can't answer. And I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't want to say, I think, because it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the facts say. So, forgive me, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah. No, man, I'm, I'm having a blast, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've been bur burning the midnight oil, man, yeah. so I, I do apologize. Well, it's not, I, man, I know you I have promise. a hugely busy schedule, and so even for a modicum of your time, I'm immensely grateful. And personally, I'm curious if... What's going on at Skinwalker? Did ATIP study that? And I know you don't like to espouse, but what do you what do you think is going on there? Sub question. Let me say before I forget it. And then I wanted to know what is there a connection between Bigfoot and UFOs? Because there seems to be a confluence of that at Skinwalker at least. So uh I, I worked with colleagues that were focused on the OSAP and the Skinwalker uh phenomenon. Uh, what I what I can say is that they are very convinced, and and I think I am too, that there are things that probably go bump in the night, that probably need further explanation. Uh, but but that is that was not my portfolio, and I don't want to speak to that because I simply don't know. Um, that was done at a time with with the tremendous efforts of Mr. Bigelow and and the former director, uh, OSAP director, uh, and a lot of folks uh, from from Bigelow Aerospace. And you know, the data was very compelling. I'll say that. It was absolutely compelling. And I think Mr. Brandon Fugel now and others have, have recognized <laughs> the validity of some of that data. Um, but uh, that's, that's all I'm prepared to say about that. As far as Bigfoot, I'm going to share something with you. And I, I, hope, I hope that this doesn't turn anybody off. Um, it's probably going to turn me on. <laughs> um, I had the great honor and privilege of speaking with some people from the First Nations of Saskatchewan, Indigenous people, uh, of the Lakota and Dakota bands. Um, these are uh, individuals who are fiercely proud, uh, have an incredible heritage, and um, have nearly 10,000 years of oral tradition okay, in, in, in this continent. Uh, and they have an incredible connection to the land. And uh, I was asked by, by someone there, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to say who it was, but a, a very senior individual who was associated with, with the First Nations people. And he asked me, he said, I want to ask you a question, Lou. Have you ever seen Sasquatch? I said, no, sir. She said, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you sure you've never seen Sasquatch? I said, sir, I, I've never seen, seen Sasquatch. And he said, well, that's good. Because from my people's perspective, Sasquatch is a spirit that protects our women and children and a spirit of the forest. And if you see a man see Sasquatch, it means your heart is impure. And I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> I was like, holy smokes, I'm sure glad I haven't seen Sasquatch. Um, interesting. But yeah, that was their, there was their take. Uh, it, very, very interesting. But who among is, us have pure hearts? Well, I, that's, that's a whole other question, right? I don't think any of us really do have pure hearts, but, but the fact that, that they see it that way, uh, I found very, very interesting. Um, it's a it's very unique perspective. And I think if anybody has a, has a, 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 has a right to have a narrative on, on Sasquatch, it's certainly indigenous people. Um, so I, I found that, again, I, I, I can't tell you whether or not that's true. I can just tell you what was told to me. But... Um, you know, there you have it. As for Skinwalker in general, you just think your statement is there is something that's going bump in the night or you think there is. Nothing more well, can be said about that. I'm hugely interested in Skinwalker. You know, uh, Kurt, at some point. More is to be uh, revealed. Yeah, you know, I, it's, I, I don't want to go down any rabbit holes prematurely. Um, you know, this this is a very... <laughs> This is a very complex universe we live in, uh, and it's a system. And uh, we're learning more and more about the, 
reality of life and, and, and the transition of what birth means and the transition of what death means and, and uh, you know, human consciousness and human spirit and whatnot. Um, and, you know, suffice it to say, I, I, we, we probably really don't have a very good handle right now on, on understanding um, what lies beyond our five senses. I've said this before, we have five fundamental senses for which we, we judge our environment. And if you can't touch it, taste it, hear it, smell it, or you know, feel whatever, um, it, it's, it, it doesn't exist. And yet the reality is 99.9% .9 of the universe lies well beyond our, our ability to sense these things. We have Wi-Fi signals coursing through your body every moment of every day. We have cosmic radiation coming from the cosmos. We've got neutrinos that are flooding your body from the sun. And we've got cellular signals and radar signatures that are coming from the local airport. And all these are real. And I tell people, if you want to know the reality of the universe, look at a night sky one night and look how pretty it is. Now take a radio telescope and look at that same night sky. Look at it through infrared. Look at it through, through ultraviolet. And you're going to see things you've never seen before. And so by definition, 99% of our, our, our knowable universe, we can't even perceive. And then when you look at the scale of the universe, and I've said this before, if you look at, you know, the, I, I was corrected recently that the, the visible galaxy, the visible, part, the visible known universe is about 90 some uh, billion light years across, even though it's only been around for 13.7 billion light years, we think. Uh, that the actual, for the, 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 the seeable universe right now around us is, is about 97 billion light years. And as big as that is in terms of us being this little tiny minute thing stuck in the middle of it, there is equally that amount of space, relative space inside every one of us. If you look at an atom, which is one times 10 to the minus 26 in size in a mole, compare that to, to the human body. Uh, we have that same that same amount of space inside every one of us. There's a whole universe inside of us, and so, so the scale in which we live, unless something is 50 feet in front of our face, we'll never be able to interact with anything that is an order of magnitude above us or below us. We can't even see the cells in our bodies without a microscope. So, so there are these realities all around us that constantly that that exist and that we are part of, and yet we cannot interact with. And, and by that definition. 99.9% .9 of the universe falls outside of the realm of our perception. So who's to say that, that all of reality needs to fit neatly within the very narrow spectrum of the electro optical, electro optical frequency that we call visible light when we know that that's not true? Same thing with acoustics, same thing with electromagnetic, same thing with everything. And I think it's foolhardy for science to presume that, that everything can be explained through the fundamental five senses and the scale in which we live, because we know that's not true. Look at dark energy and dark matter. Most of the universe can't even be seen. All right, even the fundamental forces. Who knows fundamental if there's more? Fundamental forces, right. Right, strong force, weak force, electromagnetism, right. So, so you know, I, I think we need to remember, if you are truly a scientist, we must remain open to the fact that, that we are judging our environment through a very, very narrow lens. Uh, it's like watching a sitting uh, up on the bleachers, watching a football game at the very, very highest part of the bleachers, and watching the whole game through a soda straw. You're you're gonna miss most of it, you know. So that would be my that'd be my uh, my two cents. Emil S says thanks. Thank Lewis for me. Without him, we wouldn't be where we are today with regard to this matter. And Mr. Roboto also says thank you, Mr. Elizondo, for the service for your service to this country. Oh, my pleasure. You know what? Everybody serves in their own way. Uh, if you're a taxpayer, you're serving. If you are a school teacher, you're serving. If you're a nurse, you're serving. If you're a police officer, you're, you're a person, military uniform. You know, uh, if you're a lawyer and, and you decide to take a case pro bono because it's the right thing to do, guess what? You're serving. So, so thank you for, for, for all those out there who continue to serve. You know, uh, it, it's, it's a great honor and privilege to be, to be speaking with you here today. Thank you, man. Andreas says, hey, Lou, are there questions you think that the public hasn't been asking that we ought to be? What should we be asking? <laughs> I was going to be flippant for a second, but no. <laughs> was gonna... no go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I think you're on the right track. I, th I think people are asking the right questions. Um, I, I, I do. I think people are. I, I think. I think people are coming around to to reality of, of this new paradigm, um, and that's good. That's okay. That, that's a good thing. Um, you know, otherwise we stagnate as species.
Jen Hagney asks, on April 30th, I believe of this year, in the basement office interview, Lou said, watch out for the next 30 days. Now, what was he referencing? All of it. A lot has happened in the 30 days. Why don't you give a breakdown for the people like myself who are new to this field that have little clue? Imagine I'm clueless, which I am. Sure. Uh, you have uh, very senior level briefings happening to Congress. You have Congress wanting uh, potentially to do open hearings. Uh, you have an IG uh, evaluation underway uh, to look at how the government's been handling this topic over the last three years. Um, you have... <laughs> You've got quite a bit of things happening right now. You've got foreign governments that haven't quite come out yet that are beginning to engage the United States. Uh, you have uh, discussions on creating a, a, a long-term enduring capability to look at this effort, full of government approach. Um, you know, oh, okay. Well, speaking about the world government, not that there is one, but you and understand. By the way, Kurt, I'm being effort. told right now, I've got, I've got just about a couple, few more minutes because my I have another, unfortunately, one more engagement i have to do that that's, that's no problem man okay My apologies no 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 problem I, I appreciate the time that you've given so blind arise asks all of this recent disclosure and activity has been very u.s focused it would be interesting to know if other countries are working on this stuff too or are cooperating at some level the implication is that whoever can reverse engineer this tech at first wins but isn't our chance isn't it best to give our chance to all humans yes 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 and yes yes i'm all for parts. Yes, uh, uh, you know, there are other countries working on this. Yes, there are other governments that are reaching out to work with us. Uh, yes, that uh, he who, who, who reveals the secret first has the advantage. And yes, this would be better for humanity if we worked it all together. Mikhail Mayhall asks, did ATIP look into the USS Trepang photos from 1971? Negative, we did not. Neon Dagger, has Lewis ever had a personal encounter, whether it was close up or at a distance, with an intelligence or some kind of or some kind of machine? I assume they were referring to the UAPs. That will be for another discussion. Okay, and I'll get to just two more quick questions. Okay. Paul Sawford asks, I would like his take on the tic tac movement at sea level. Actually, forget that question. Sorry, Paul. There's a better question. Don't feel bad, Paul. I would have answered it. Okay, Rayson Carlos asks, could you ask him about the Nimitz case? David Fravers said that David Fravers said that the tic tac shaped UFO, after disappearing from his view, appeared to the radar operator at, at his quote unquote cap point. What does this represent? How on earth did the UFO know the cap point beforehand? Great question. Uh, we don't know how it knew. Uh, either that or it's one hell of a coincidence. A cap point is a rendezvous point. That is uh, input into the flight plan of the pilots and the uh, and the avionics systems of the aircraft. Uh, in this case, it was about 60 miles away from their their, their location uh, where they encountered the tic tac, and within five seconds, this thing appeared over their cap point, uh, seemingly uh, anticipating where they were supposed to go and waiting for them. Great question. That uh, is this some sort of active exploitation of the avionics, uh, or is this some sort of uh, predetermination understanding where? was going to go because somehow it understands space time in a different way than we do or was it just a pure coincidence we simply don't know and the last question i asked you before which i'm going to get back to actually hunting harris says sam harris said that he was contacted by the former dod slash intelligence officials about some possible form of disclosure was it lou or melon I'm sorry, can you repeat that one Okay, time? so Sam Harris recently said that he was contacted by someone from the former DOD intelligence, and he wants to know, and Sam Harris was talking about a possible form of disclosure. Was this person who contacted Sam Harris? I have Lou no idea who Sam Harris is, neither does Chris. Okay. No, no clue who Sam Harris is. I, then, I know, you got to get going. The Lonesome Space Cowboy, remember that last question that you couldn't get to, which was, if the general public knew or saw what you saw, how would they, what would the next week look like? How would the public react? Somber. Uh, I think there would be this uh, big exhale for about a day. And then this uh, turning inward and trying to reflect on what this means to us and our species and ourselves. Uh, 
I think uh, somber. Sorry, I'll, like a sigh of relief. Somber meaning serious. Not not like Hollywood portrays people partying in the streets and, and, and silliness like that. Um, I think you would have uh, some people perhaps turning to religion more so. Uh, you might have some people turning away from religion. Um, I think you're going to have, um, at that point, the, the philosophical and theological uh, questions will be raised and, and people will have some serious soul searching to do, no pun intended. And I don't think that's bad, by the way. Um, I think uh, a lot of folks that have spent their times in this community being charlatans will have been exposed and uh, they will be probably unemployed and probably have to change their names because, you know, <laughs> the rest of society will look at them in an unfavorable light. Um, I think um, there are some unsung heroes that will probably come to light and uh, the world will appreciate their contributions to this topic. I think the names, scientific community, oh, sorry. the academic communities. No, I can't give those names. Uh, the I know what I was going to say is names that have been announced before when you say the unsung heroes or new yeah, names. names have been announced before. New okay. Uh, I think the scientific and academic community is going to have to take a real hard look at itself uh, and, and uh, see why it repeated the same mistakes it did when Galileo first proposed that the earth was not the center of the solar system. Uh, you know, um, hubris is, 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 is a big part of that. Um, and then I think, you know, maybe we start the international conversation say, okay, we realize that this, there's, there's some things out there that are probably well beyond our, our petty discrepancies we have with each other. Um, maybe we really need to start working together on this. Realize that we are really a global family. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from, or it doesn't matter what your religion is or your culture or your color or anything else. Uh, we are, we are all, uh, we are all brothers and sisters on this tiny little rock called Earth. You know, this pale blue dot that's hurtling through, through space. Um, we may unify us. Well, I, I would certainly hope so. Uh, unless we allow our, 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 our poor nature to, to interfere and we look at this as, as, as opportunities to sub subjugate each other. Uh, I, would hope, I would hope that's not the case. Uh, Lou, thank yeah, you so I, much. Do you have any sure, advice for me as someone investigating this topic somewhat anew and somewhat... Sure, keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep asking the questions and, and be fearless. Um, you know, that is the true scientific pioneering spirit, the ability to challenge the status quo uh, and, and be able to do so uh, in, a, in, a, in a courageous way and, and in a well-meaning way. Um, the, the true enemy of science is, is stagnation is acceptance of the norms because we know that's not real science changes our understanding changes because we're human and humans change so uh you know we, we need to continue to pursue the truth wherever that truth may be we need to continue to pursue it so that'd be my advice thank you sir i appreciate it what do you have to promote where can the audience find out more about you what's next for you Oh, Kurt, I, I hate self-promoting, man. I, I'm not that guy, you know. I, I hate even tweeting. I do it because I want to keep people engaged because I, I really appreciate everybody's perspectives. Um, but, uh, you know, I just want to promote the truth wherever that truth is. Um, a lot of people don't realize I don't I don't get paid for these, these type of, of things. I'm actually taking off work to just do it because I believe in it so much. You're not paid by the government to spread misinformation? Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, every day, sure. Yeah, I mean, if that's that's what what certainly these conspiracy theorists like to believe, anyways. You know, uh, by the way, if that's the case, I'm sure not making a whole lot of money doing it. Um, but uh, you know, all 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 BS aside, no, uh, I'm I'm not being paid. It's just uh, I'm not being I'm not uh, you know still wearing my counterintelligence hat, and I'm trying to deceive the American public. I mean, it's just just that's that's just nonsense. That's that. Same crap that has held that conspiracy theory that's kept, kept the ufology uh, community behind for, for 70 years. You know, it's, it's time to grow up, you know, wake up and, and, and stop, stop uh, thinking everybody's out to get you. You know, yeah, there's been some mistakes done in the past, but, you know, people, there's some people that actually want to see, see the truth come out, you know, and I'm one of those guys. If you don't like what I have to say, then don't listen. You know, I'm not forcing anybody to tune in and listen. I'm not, you know, forcing you to sit down on a couch. Um, 
you know, if you don't like what I have to say, this is a free country. Thank God, you know, you know tune into something else. Well, I listen to you and hopefully once the dust settles, we can have a longer conversation, perhaps even in person once COVID is over. I would love that, Kurt. Anytime you want. It would be my honor and privilege. Thank you, man. I, like, it's, it, you make me feel giddy by by saying that, even if it's just politeness. Thank you so much, man. No, I listen, people know me personally. I am that guy. I I, I say what I mean. If I say that we're, we're going to do coffee, we will be damn sure we're going to do coffee at some point. So I don't say these things lightly. I, I mean what I say. Thank you, Lou. Have a great one. I apologize for yes, keeping sir. you over time. Thank no you. Worries. And to Kurt, say bye to so everyone. Much. They're so happy to see you. There's, Let's see how many Thank people. you to your audience. I hope I didn't offend anybody. That wasn't my intent. Uh, there are almost 3,000 people coffee. watching right now. Wow. That's great, Kurt. Well, you know, I'm like I said, I'm, I've always told people I'm Latin. Uh, I've got to have my coffee. Uh, there's a, a few things that we come out of the womb having to, to do it and, and Strong coffee is one of them. So uh, I apologize if I was a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, ornery today. That wasn't my intent, but I'm, I'm going to go get some coffee and I'll, I'll, I'll fix myself right up. All right, man. Get to it. Take care. Yes, sir. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, God bless everybody.